and the world. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I'll be reading Acts 9, 1 through 20. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus. But get up, oh, Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and at the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying. And as he seen in a vision, a man named Ananias came in and laid his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saint in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument who I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings. And before the people of Israel, I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples of Damascus. And immediately, he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Amen. Would you join me in prayer at this time? Lord, I thank you for this uh, awesome opportunity to share your word with the folks here today lord i pray that the words that are spoken here now will glorify you and honor you and lord just that you would speak to each one of us individually here today i pray this in jesus name amen no i'm not going to sing my way (laughs) right about a light that's a good song yeah, Blinded by the Light is the name of the sermon today. Yeah, there was that song, Blinded by the Light. I'm not even going to sing that one. Y'all know it if, you, if you're familiar with it. I was thinking about Saul of Tarsus today. Yes. What an unlikely person to become a Christian, to follow Christ, to be a Christ follower. How completely unexpected. And yet how it is like God to do just that, to take that unexpected person and to do something spectacular with that person. I don't know if they had high school yearbooks back at the time that Saul of Tarsus was around. I could just see that when he was a senior, good old THS, that's Tarsus High School, (laughs) not Topeka High School, but Tarsus High School, and they had a little section in there about the senior class of the year 00. 031 or whatever year it was and it came up to Paul and I could just imagine the person least likely to become a Christian Saul of Tarsus right there and Saul's got a big smile on his face like yeah I'll never be a Christian man this is never going to happen 
But as we see with the Lord, He can do anything, anytime, with anyone, however He wants to do. Amen. And this story today, it's phenomenal. It's it's one of the really the great stories I think in the Bible because we see the way God really operates. And how he will do things that actually make no sense at all in human terms. That makes total sense in his way of doing things. We know the story of Saul, I believe. If you don't, let me give you a quick recap. Saul was what you would call a rising star in the Jewish faith. He was well regarded. He was a scholar. I believe he was a Pharisee. He was very much one in tune with the Jewish law. And one of the things that he felt really strongly about was that it was his duty, his responsibility... To go out and try to stamp out this thing that was sort of spreading like wildfire called Christianity. This new church that had Jesus Christ as its founder. And so there were people who were early disciples of Christ. One of whom was Stephen. And Stephen also ran afoul of some of the leaders of his day when he spoke a very profound sermon in front of the religious leaders. And they did not appreciate it, to say the least. Because in short order, Stephen was being stoned by the very people he was preaching to. And watching that terrible execution was this person named Saul of Tarsus. He was standing there as they put their cloaks right there by his feet. And I'm sure it was so they could get a better wind-up and throw those stones even harder. Yeah, put your cloaks here. You guys can throw the rocks harder if you just take off your outer jacket. Well, this is Saul, one who thought he was doing what God wanted him to do. I truly believe he was a deeply spiritual man, but he wasn't really doing what God wanted him to do. He was more following tradition. He was following what he had been brought up to believe. And so in this story today, Saul is heading up to Damascus, which is not even close to Israel. It's 150 miles from Jerusalem. That's a pretty good chunk of change, isn't it? It's like from here to, what, Columbia, Missouri, pretty much. It's a long drive. Well, he wasn't driving. He had to walk. And as he is going on this road to Damascus, what happens? As he's getting closer and closer to going up to Damascus to round up the Christians who were living there. All of a sudden, Saul is blinded by the light. A light comes down out of heaven, and it blinds Saul. Yeah. He's completely caught off guard. Doesn't know why this light came down until he hears the voice saying, Saul, hey Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says this, Who are you, Lord? I believe Saul knew who it was. And then the voice said, It's Jesus who you're persecuting. And so now Saul here, uh, is struck blind. He can't believe what he's just heard, what's happened to him. He can't deny it. It happened. So the Lord tells him to go into Damascus and find a house there by uh, the person named Judas. Stay there at this house on Straight Street. And I'll tell you what to do. Paul just or Saul just go in there. Now Saul is eventually going to be known as Paul. But at that time, he was just completely flabbergasted, I believe. He goes in there, and he's there for... These three days and three nights doesn't eat and doesn't drink. He is just waiting for the Lord to tell him what's next. Meanwhile, there's a person named Ananias who was one of those who had been persecuted, we believe, from the Jerusalem area. And he moves up into Damascus up in Syria, again, 150 miles away. Now, i got to tell you, friends, it's interesting what happened at that early church because they were being persecuted right and left. The, 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 the early Christians were definitely under Fire. They were in the bullseye. They were in the crosshairs of the authorities and the establishment. They were not welcome. And so rather than just being in Jerusalem where everything's nice and cozy, you know, they had their Dillons and their Aldis and their Walmarts. I mean, kind of like that. You can imagine that was home for them. That was, that was, they were comfortable there. Persecution came and they began to scatter. It took the persecution for this group of people to start moving. So what looked like a terrible thing on the front end God had a plan for that, too, because he was going to use that to move this message all over the world. That was his whole design. And that's why Paul was going up to Damascus to round up these Christians that had gone up there, sending a message. I got my eye on you. 
I'll go 150 miles if it takes that. And if, if it needs to go farther than that, I'll go 350. But I'm going to round you guys up. And we're going to send a message. We're going to stamp out this group known as the Way, those early Christians. So Paul, again, gets blinded by the light. He goes up there. In that place, again, is Ananias, who had moved up there, we believe, from that Jerusalem area, fleeing persecution. And Ananias is doing okay. All of a sudden, he hears the voice of the Lord to go and speak to somebody over at the house of Judas on Straight Street. And I think Ananias was fine with that. Okay, Lord, I'll head on over. Oh, by the way, did I tell you it's a person named Saul of Tarsus? That's who you're going to go speak to. And I think at that point, Ananias got a little bit concerned. Saul of Tarsus was notorious for what he was doing, was stamping out the Christians, killing the Christians, uh, rounding them up. And I think Ananias probably did something like, Lord, I thought, I thought you said, maybe I heard you wrong, Lord. I thought you, this is funny, Lord. I thought you said, I'm going to go and minister to Saul of Tarsus. Lord, that's funny. Okay, who is it really that I'm going to go see? Uh, no, Ananias, it is Saul of Tarsus. What? Again, the least likely candidate to become a Christian, to become a follower of Christ. I can imagine Ananias probably goes, what if he's just embedding himself in the Christian church so he sees what we're doing, gets a little inside information, then he goes back and tells everybody, and then they really wipe us out. I mean, there will be lots of good excuses, right, to do that. I mean, I think the Christian church for a long time, maybe some of us in general, have used that term, what if, and we've talked ourselves out of things that God wants us to do. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if? What if? Instead of just obeying God. So Ananias, to his credit, he goes and obeys the Lord. And I've got to give Ananias a lot of credit. What if Ananias had not obeyed the Lord? Would there have been an apostle Paul? And God probably would have worked it out somehow else. I don't know. But we know this, that Ananias was obedient. He had faith. And God used him, just an ordinary person, to go and minister when he told them to go. So when God's telling you and me to do things, we just have to do it. We don't have the time to sit there and go, well, let, let's see how we can talk our way out of it. Because I'll tell you what, we can talk our way out of anything. Mm-hmm. We're pretty good at that. I'm pretty good at that. Ananias goes and he meets Paul, and Saul, I should say. Saul of Tarsus is there, and I can just picture this dark room, and Saul's just sort of sitting there, and Ananias uh, puts his hand on and prays for him, says, the Lord has sent me here. You've got a great mission in front of you, and something like scales fell off of his eyes. I remember when I was a little kid, I thought, that was so cool. Things like scales fell off his eyes. I wonder what that would have looked like, these little things on the ground, you know. Anyway, and then we know that Saul becomes known as Paul. He becomes a great evangelist. He gets the one that's probably the most central figure in most of the New Testament. He wrote almost the whole New Testament other than the Gospels. All these great teachings that Paul did that God used him for. He was uniquely qualified. He was the only one that could have done this. He was very highly regarded in the Jewish community. He knew the laws upward and downward, forward and backward. He knew it all. He was also a Roman citizen. He had all these things going for him. Very brilliant mind, Paul was. And I believe that as you read through the New Testament, so many of the books in the Bible, Paul wrote, and they were letters, but a lot of them were to correct the early church, to keep them on track. Because a lot of the churches were bringing in, dabbling in other religions. You know, they're taking a little bit of this and a little bit of that and trying to mix them in. And, and Paul's message was always, oh no, it's all about grace. We're saved by grace through faith, not of our works. So that no one can boast. That was Paul's central message throughout his whole teachings. It was always about the grace of God. We're saved through Jesus. Nothing else. If Paul would have compromised on any of those things, I believe the church today would look totally different than it does. But Paul refused to compromise. And so God had great plans for Paul. And, and, and a lot of it had to do again with, I believe, Ananias being obedient and doing what God told him to do. Great story. I love that story. And you know, once Paul started out in that 180 degree change of direction, he never looked back. I never once saw Paul go, man, I, I really liked it better when I was you know, serving into the synagogues and, and, and being a, a religious leader. Paul, Paul never looked back. It was completely for Jesus. Sometimes I'm afraid some of us, we like to look back and we go, you know, I liked it back then when I was doing this or that or I was indulging myself in this or that and Whatever it might have been. It might have been sinful, but it was just self-serving. And we don't get to really see 
the fullness of God and the Holy Spirit in our life because we have limited him to what used to be done. He's got a whole new mission for us, but we've got to let go of that. And so here's one of these takeaways today, again, that God will use anybody that he chooses to use. He seeks to use us in ways that we may not ever understand. But I will say this, the only way we're ever going to get used by him is if we completely empty ourselves of ourselves. Does that make sense? We cannot be giving Jesus Christ the marching orders. We've got to do it his way. And we have to surrender to him. A lot of people don't want to do that because, you know, like I said, they want to do it their way. They want to be in control. But you know what? When we surrender to Jesus, a lot of great things happen. Well, we, we see these radical changes that have happened through the years. And now, this last week, and, and I'm, I'm going to fast forward here because I want to share a couple things with you here as we, as we kind of wrap this up. And there are a lot of people who have had radical transformations in their life all through these last 2,000 years. And so I came up a, across a few. Are you ready to show a few slides? So one of, so I'm just going to give you some people that I looked at this week that I thought were kind of interesting, that are more contemporary, maybe in our lifetime or in the last, I don't know, 100 years or so. Some are, are very much with us now. First of all, there was this rock star by the name of Alice Cooper. Now, Alice Cooper was known as the godfather of shock rock. But, you know, in 2006, he shocked people, all right, but it wasn't because of his antics on stage. He became a born-again Christian. And today, he speaks of his great love for Christ. I like what he says. Drinking beer is easy. Trashing your hotel room is easy. But being a Christian, that's a tough call. That's rebellion. Friends, if you want to be a rebel in today's culture, follow Jesus. If you are going to be like everybody else in the world, thinking that you're a rebel, acting like a rebel, dressing like a rebel, you're just conforming to the world's image. And there, I don't think people realize that there's just this conformity to this idea of being a rebel, but everybody's just fitting in with that group. You want to be a rebel, swim upstream, cut against the grain, follow Jesus. That's how you're going to be a true rebel. Amen. Second thing is a person by the name of Steve McQueen. Y'all know Steve McQueen, the king of cool. They go, oh, let's look at Charles Colson. That's fine. Charles Colson was the hatchet man in the Nixon White House. You remember Charles Colson? He was high up on the, on the list of Richard Nixon's cabinet. And so I want to read you what he writes about right up here. You know, we were talking about the, the resurrection of Jesus a few weeks ago. Charles Colson would not have been a candidate for being a born again Christian until he got nailed for what he had done in this Watergate scandal. And he goes to prison. He becomes a born-again Christian. Then he leads something called Prison Fellowship, which has been going strong ever since his passing. So Charles Colston's radical transformation came through a very difficult time in his life. And again, he never was the same. This is I like what he says here. I know, And he's talking about the resurrection here. I, this is why I put this slide up. Thank you for doing this. I, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead, and then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles couldn't? Keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. And you know what? All those early Christians that went to their death, amen? amen. So amen. they had to have something that they were believing in. So a lot of, a lot of evidence sometimes just in the people. Let's look at the next slide here. C.S. Lewis, a great author, uh, kind of an agnostic up until his latter years. He was a brilliant man, wrote a lot of books like the Narnia Chronicles, all these books. You've seen uh, some of them have been turned into movies. C.S. Lewis became a devout Christian, a great author and an apologist. And he called himself the least likely convert to Christianity. Let's look at the next one here. That's Kirk Cameron. Kirk Cameron was a star on the show Growing Pain. Some of y'all remember Growing Pain back on ABC TV back in the 80s, I think. Kirk Cameron said he was an agnostic and really wasn't a believer until he got up into his teenage years. Now Kirk Cameron speaks about the Lord everywhere he goes. He's a, a great evangelist, and he's used what God has done in his life to spread the word to others. He could have kept it a secret. You know, well, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to tell anybody. I don't want anybody to think I'm weird or something. But no, he's out there on the front lines. I've got to give him a lot of props for that. Let's look at the next one here. 
That is uh, Nikki Taylor, I believe. She was a very famous model back in the 90s and had a terrible car crash, endured like 53 surgeries. And through all of those experiences, she recognized that she needed a Savior, Jesus Christ. Sometimes God puts us through hard times so that we can come back to him. Let's see what we got next up here. Oh, that's Stephen Baldwin. You know, Stephen Baldwin's part of the Baldwin brothers, and there's some uh, folks in the Hollywood set. And he completely burned his bridges with Hollywood when he became a born again Christian, and uh, he could care less. I have a feeling he just in that picture, he kind of looks like it. So, you know, what's he going to do? He looks like uh, somebody from Long Island or something. Yeah, who cares? You know, he's a really funny guy, and he speaks about his. Faith wherever he goes. So Stephen Baldwin's brother is Alec Baldwin, I think. I don't think Alec has made that jump into the Christian community yet, but he may someday. Don't ever count God out. Okay, who we got next? Oh, that's Bubba Watson, the great golfer. He decided he needed the Lord somewhere back in the early uh, 2000s. He was a famous golfer, won a lot of tournaments, was ranked number two in the in the whole world one time. And he said, you know what, I've got to find somebody. I'm showing you people who came to Christ later in life, not those that were born up and, and raised up in the church setting. These are people who found Jesus later on in life. Again, a supernatural encounter with the living God through Jesus Christ. Okay, who we got next? Oh, yeah, Kanye West. You know Kanye. Kanye, Kanye uh, again, shocked the world when he became a Christian a few years ago, started to hold these Sunday morning services at the Forum in Los Angeles, and all these people showed up. And, you know, none of these people, I'm going to say, are perfect. These are just examples of people who took the stand for Christ once they became born again. We need to pray for these folks that they will continue to stay faithful to the Lord because they've got lots of temptations that a lot of us would never understand. Mm -hmm. But i got to hand it to them. You know this gentleman here, Evil Knievel, he was a great daredevil who, as you all know, men are against the Snake Canyon, would hop on the motorcycles and go over the fountains at Caesar's Palace. I was listening to the radio the other day, and a gentleman by the name of Lee Strobel, who's written a lot of books about the case for Christ and, and a lot of other really great books. Lee Strobel was an atheist until he started looking into the existence of Christ and his uh, proof for his resurrection. Then he became a Christian through trying to disprove Christ. He becomes a Christian. Happens sometimes when they really get to meet Jesus. And he said he was on the on uh, on his phone one day and, and he gets a call and this guy says it's evil and he said well now the devil's really has found me you know <laughs> but but it was evil can evil and and evil and he said this is the story evil can evil was on a beach in florida he said the lord told me he said, it's time to turn your life over to me we've got some things to take care of let's let's just start fresh and that's basically making a long conversation into a real short one and of course he passed away not a whole lot longer after that time but he was another one that came to christ later on in his life what else we got that is uh, Brian, um, okay, Brian Welch, I believe. Yeah, he was a drummer for a group called Corn, and it's spelled K O R N. Apparently, they didn't know how to spell Corn. I mean, they weren't from Iowa or Kansas. I was going to call Brian and say, if y'all would have spelled your group name C O R N, it might have helped you uh, on the searches on the internet. But anyway, um, He's another one that really made a radical transformation. Their group was far from what you would call a Christian rock band. Let's just leave it at that. As he left his faith, or as he left the band in, in 2005, the band released a statement informing the public that they had parted ways with their rock guitarist, Brian Head Welch. Here's what it said. Who has chosen the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior and will be dedicating his musical pursuits to that end. And though some thought it was a practical joke, Welch showed up to Valley Bible Fellowship the following Sunday and told the crowd of 10,000, I'm the happiest man in the world right now. Who else we got? We're getting close now. You know this gentleman, Mr. T. <laughs> Mr. T was one of our favorites, you know, from the A-Team and all these different uh, TV shows and still proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Just, it's fun to see these folks. Sometimes we need a little encouragement, amen? We need to see people that have taken a stand, and that's what Mr. T did. He has really taken a powerful stand for the Lord, and he's on TV shows. He always gives Christ credit for all of what he's experienced. What else do we got there? Well, there's Steve McQueen again right there. That's the great guy that we may have showed earlier, but he's the guy from Bullet and all the shows, and Steve McQueen had a great transformation where he was learning how to fly an airplane out in Los Angeles back, you know, probably in the, uh, I would say somewhere in the 70s. 
Uh, he was kind of a daredevil. He'd ride motorcycles and, drunk, you know, he did all kinds of crazy stuff, ride cars real fast. Some of you folks, I think I've seen drive like Steve McQueen down to Pika Boulevard, uh, where he takes that Mustang at about 80 miles an hour, that green, emerald green motor, that green Mustang. Now, you don't need to raise your hands. I know who you are. But, <laughs> but Steve McQueen, uh, he, he was taking these flying lessons, and, and he got to meet this guy, kind of a man's man. He was just kind of a, kind of rough around the edges. And the, the pilot that was going to teach him how to fly the plane, they developed a friendship. And I'm sure that this guy, the, the, the pilot who was teaching Steve McQueen how to fly, I'm sure he didn't just give him the four spiritual laws or say, before I give you flying lessons, we need to talk about Jesus. I, I think they developed a relationship first. And that's the thing that a lot of us aren't real good at or we don't want to put the time in. It's just finding these relationships that God may put people in our lives that we just need to develop a friendship and a, and a relationship. And we start to get to the point where they'll listen to us to talk about Christ. It may take days, weeks, months, years. But if we put the time in, I believe God's going to open some doors. But we have to be ready to go through the doors when they open. We can't sit there unprepared. We've got to be ready. Well, Steve McQueen, through this gentleman, goes to his church. He invited him to his church one Sunday night. He's up in the balcony looking down. He receives Christ. And so there's this... DVD I want to show you called Steve McQueen American Icon or something like that. One of these Sunday nights we'll watch it downstairs. I got it, and I haven't even seen it yet, but it's it's, it's I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Do we have any more still? Is that it? Oh, that's um, Jennifer Garner. Jennifer Garner was a famous movie actress. You see her on the ads. You know she says, "What's in your wallet?" Remember those ads? And and uh, she did a Christian film a few years ago, and through that she rekindled her faith. So the faith sometimes will lie dormant for a while. People will go to church, and then you know they call them Christian dropouts. They just drop out. The nuns and the duns, they just kind of drop out. Then they come back. Always be willing to bring people in. If somebody comes back, don't ask them these three words. Where have you been? Don't ever ask them that. Just say, we're glad to see you. Don't ask people about that. Just, just enjoy it and bring them back in. Amen? And so she did this Christian film, and she realized something was missing. And I think she and her husband have been uh, split up for a while, but they made a commitment to bringing their kids to church. She goes to a United Methodist church of all places. How about that? So we're happy for her. She just seems like a real nice person on those ads. Anybody else? Okay. Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry is another great high rolling uh, actor who's really funny. And he's got a great platform. And he's not afraid to use it for the Lord also. So we're thank God for people like Tyler Perry. And he doesn't often speak about his religious views, but he has publicly stated uh, that he converted to Catholicism when he was younger and he continues to practice. Um, he's not afraid to include religion and religious characters in his popular movies. He says, I'm not afraid to have a character say, I am a Christian or I believe in God because I think they represent real people on this earth. So hats off to Tyler Perry. And we got anybody else? And here's one of my all-time favorites, Bob Dylan. And Bob Dylan was one, again, that you can't hardly believe that he would be the one that would come to faith in Christ. It was in the late 70s where he had this born-again experience. And Bob Dylan was called the voice of a generation. After he became a born-again Christian, he had two gospel albums. One was called Save and one was called Slow Train Coming. And the Slow Train Coming, one of the great records of all time. And on that album, there was a song called You Gotta Serve Somebody. And I still quote that song. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you've got to have to serve somebody. And that's a great song. Now, he was not well received by some of his musical cohorts. It says here, John Lennon, uh, including some of his other fans, were horrified by Dylan's conversion to Christianity. And the former Beatle even recorded a record called Serve Yourself instead of Serve Somebody. But Dylan has remained quiet about his faith, and yet he has confirmed as recently as 2012 that he still believes in Jesus. So... I think that's our last slide, isn't it? Is there one more? Well, this gentleman here now, we all got to take our hat off to him. That is none other than Saul of Tarsus. And he's probably the greatest convert of, of uh, Christianity. You know, uh, in closing this off today, I'll just say this. Saul of Tarsus, uh, it was an amazingly quick thing. It was like, I, I described it as... If you were at Heartland Park taking one of those dragsters and going about 300 miles down the straightaway and, and to be able to flip it and turn and go 300 miles just like that the other way, that's kind of what happened to him. That, that was that radical. And I remember a lady one time we were in a Sunday school class and she said, 
It was an amazing transition for Paul. I thought, it wasn't no transition, honey. It was a radical transformation. It was that quick. It was like that. Transitions are great. And some of us will go through transitions. Some of us will take time. But sometimes it's going to be that quick. And that's what happened to him. It was that quick. When God wants to do something quick, he'll do it quick. When he wants to take his time, he'll take his time. One thing I will say is we've just got to be ready to act on it when he's speaking to us. Don't put it off. Because we don't have any guarantee about tomorrow. None of us do. So let's just take advantage of the opportunities that we've got. So in closing, just remember this. That God will use anybody, anytime, anyway. Anybody in this room, he will use just as he chooses to do. It's going to be what he wants to do. If we will, again, empty ourselves of ourselves, of our selfishness, of our self-righteousness, of our ideas, of our opinions. Just get all that stuff put on the altar and let Christ come in and fill us. He's got great plans for us. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, the, the message of Paul. We thank you for some of these modern-day converts, too. Lord, Just they're, they're, it's fun to know that there are some other people out there. We're not the only ones. Lord, help us not to be afraid to be a rebel, not to gain attention to ourselves or rub people the wrong way, but just to show people that we are fully, 100% committed to you and that we won't let anybody or anything stop us from following you. And we pray this now in Jesus' name.